Hello, everyone. My name is Maurice Owens. I want to start by saying how honored I am to be speaking to you today. I want to thank Concordia for sharing their powerful platform and stage to shed light on such a noble American cause and something very personal and a personal mission of my own, uh, changing the narrative and circumstances for young boys and men of color. Uh, I, will start, I, will, I want to say that I'm still this just a skinny kid from the Bronx. I went from being a Bronx high school basketball standout to a college classroom in South Carolina at Fermi University, then off to the Air Force Base in Misawa, Japan, followed by deployment to Kirk, Iraq, then navigated the prestigious halls of the, office, the halls and offices of the White House West Wing to include the Situation Room, and ending my career as a special assistant to the Chief of Staff, encompassing most of my most recent seven and a half years, to now landing happily as the head of the DC office for Libra, a privately owned international business group wholly owned by the Log Logothetis family, a family whose ethos is to change the definition of capitalism by making social responsibility a priority. I am very proud to be a new member of their group. Um, the, begin the beginning of my life story, if told in more detail, would sound identical to many of our boys and young men of color who are growing up in the Bronx today. Every day, these young men have to circumvent, dodge, and make life-changing decisions on joining gangs, drugs, using them or selling them, stick up kids, homeless, being homeless, teen pregnancy, abusive relationships, domestic violence, hunger, unemployment, and altercations with police, just to name a few. Without, support, without a supporting single mother of three, ambition of my own and mentors provide additional guiding hand slash vision, my life as I know it now would never, would, would something would never be even imagined. The staggering statistics for boys and young men of color who are growing up like I did need the undivided attention and efforts of everyone in sitting in this room. There's no fielding the whole team or all hands on decks on the, in the United States if these boys and young men of color are not in the game or not even part of the conversation for that matter. The systemic realities of boys and young men of color, the things that they face, is a disgrace to our nation's creed, of which I've served the United States Air Force to support and defend over a decade proudly. A united effort is the only way to change this narrative, and we all must step up. Today, Concordia partnered with my brother's Keeper Alliance serve as an example of how we can convene and truly address these systemic issues and outcomes for our young men of color. My Brothers Keeper Initiative, when launched February 2014, had intentions on tackling following staggering statistics, to name a few. Black, Af American Indian, Hispanic children are between six and nine times more likely than white children to live in areas of concentrated poverty. Roughly two-thirds of black and one-third of Hispanic children live with only one parent. A father's absence increases the risk of their child dropping out of school. Blacks and Hispanic raised by single moms are 75% and 96% respectively more likely to drop out of school. Overall, in 2013, half of young black men ages 20 to 24 were unemployed, were employed, compared to over two thirds of young white men who were employed. This employment gap persists as men get older. While, 6 of, uh, while only 6% of the overall population, black males accounted for 43% of the victims of murder in 2011. In 2012, black males were six times more likely to be in prison than white males. Hispanic males, two and a half times more likely. And lastly, another statistic that's jaw-dropping to me, but I can relate. By the age of three, children from low-income households have heard roughly 30 million fewer words than the higher-income peers. There are six milestones we should address recommended by the research of the MBK Task Force and now in the forefront of My Brother's Keeper Alliance Foundation. One, entering school ready to learn. Two, reading at a grade level by third grade. Three, graduating from high school ready for college and career. Four, completing post-secondary education and training. Six, five, successfully entered the workforce, and six, reducing violence and providing a second chance, which is, we know is very, very important. As, as I navigated and narrowly missed being a statistic myself, with the help of my heroes and mentors, I would like to name a few of those for you. First, my mother, who fought every day to provide home and opportunity for me and my siblings, despite our low-income circumstances. My high school school, appearance, school experience was a little bit different, attributed to a sponsorship program my mother found, allowing me to go to Catholic high school in the Bronx. My sponsor and mentor was John. John worked at Goldman and Sachs at the time. So trips to John's house, who lived right down the street on Fifth Avenue, on the visit with him and his family, were very, very eye-opening to me. He had a doorman, he had a car service, he had an elevator man, and his son was playing the violin at five. His, his son, who was two, was, was reading dinosaur names I couldn't even pronounce. 
So I would hang out with them for a few, then I would take that $25 cat, $25 cat ride back to my world. So that's how close it was. John provided for me a window that was out there, a world that I can actually touch and see with my own eyes. Their ambition was born. You don't know what you don't know. My neighborhood barber, Ronnie, taught me the value of my appearance. I would sit in his barbershop for hours just to get a haircut because I knew he wanted, to look, he wanted me to look my best as I worked towards my goals. I secretly learned how to cut my own hair from sitting in the barbershop so long. Very, very valuable in the military when you're 3,000 out, 3, miles away from home and can't find a barber. He also stood as a constant voice in conversation on what was right and what was wrong in the, as the streets raised me and my friends. Consistent was ver consistency was very valuable to me back then and it still is. It's sad to say that the realities of uh, many of young boys and men of color we are talking about now have no one consistent in their lives. Ms. Slattery, my high school math teacher, expected great things from me academically and I never wanted to let her down. She started an expectation compass inside of me, something I never lost sight of. There's so much power in somebody expecting greatness from you. You will kill yourself not trying not to let them down. Mike Bright, who's here today, he's my first basketball coach, taught me the value of hard work. He rewarded me exclusively one time with a cab ride home with him and, other, and the other coaches after a good game while my other teammates rode back in a crowded van. I carried that confidence with me forever after that ride. He also told me never be afraid to leave your friends because not everyone is going to go where you're going. That was very, very, that's a compass for me as well. Sergeant Weston, early in my military career in Japan, where I was there for four years, he taught me how to install a car stereo, change tires on a car, what it meant to invest in someone as a mentor. He would come get me here at 7 a.m. in the morning on Saturdays to show me how to do these things. On my car, not even his, so I wasn't cheap labor. But seriously, I long for the day that our youth look at dentists, engineers, animators, corporate executives, policemen, and software engineers, just to name a few, as role models and as potential careers for themselves. To know that there are more career options available to them besides being an entertainer, a professional athlete, and or a drug dealer, and using the term career as it relates to being a drug dealer very loosely, I personally remember the day and where I was when I was approached and decided not to sell drugs. Unfortunately, I remember dealing with the realities of jail time and other less forgiving consequences thereafter associated with my best friend who decided differently that same day. Without exposure, opportunity, and mentors, these amazing career paths I mentioned don't even exist, not even in the imagination of these young minds we are trying to reach. If I serve an as an example of what happens when exposure, opportunity, and mentors are united, this is a wonderful reality, and I'm proud to spread the word. However, I'd rather be standing up here to tell the same story beside the 20 plus childhood friends that I lost to gun violence and drugs back in my neighborhood in the Bronx, right down the street, just 9.1 miles from here. And to end, uh, I want to end with a quote from my mentor, my friend, and our 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. And I quote, we need to give every child, no matter what they look like, where they live, the chance to reach their full potential. Because if we do, if we help these, young, young, these wonderful young men become better husbands and fathers and well-educated, hardworking, good citizens, then not only will they contribute to the growth and prosperity of this country, but they will pass on those lessons to their children, onto their grandchildren. We'll start a different cycle. And, in this, and this country will be richer and stronger for it for generations to come." End quote. Thank you. I now want to, I now want to turn your attention to a video. My name is Darnell Montero. I am 90 years old. Has I learned about my brother keepers and the people who are now stepping up to support me, I feel much more confident about my future and the future of so many young people like me. We believe in the idea that no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you came from, if you work hard, then America is a place where you can make something of your lives. In every community in America, there are young people with incredible drive and talent, and they just don't have the same kinds of chances that somebody like me had. My journey, my personal journey, is exactly what this is about. To transform lives and communities 
There are many, many dozens and dozens of young men and women of color that are left behind. We brought business leaders and faith leaders, athletes, musicians, actors, all united around the simple idea of giving all our young people the tools they need to achieve their full potential. How well we do as a nation depends on whether our young people are succeeding. That's our future workforce. It is an honor to me to introduce to you the President of the United States, Barack Obama. There are communities that don't have enough jobs, don't have enough investment, don't have enough opportunity. Communities with 30 or 40 or 50 percent unemployment. What we gathered here to talk about today is something that goes deeper than policing. It speaks to who we are as a nation and what we're willing to do to make sure that equality is not an empty word. I'm interested in responsibility and I'm interested in results. And that's why we launched something we call My Brother's Keeper an initiative to address those persistent opportunity gaps and ensure that all of our young people, but particularly young men of color, have a chance to go as far as their dreams will take. I'm gonna keep on fighting and everybody here is gonna keep on fighting to make sure that all of our kids have the opportunity to make of their lives what they will. Today is just the beginning. We're gonna keep at this for you, the young people of America, for your generation and for all generations to come. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Robert DeJong, and I work for uh, Deloitte Consulting um, in a new um, practice called Social Impact that was launched earlier this week. Um, Social Impact for Deloitte is really focused on helping the public, private, and social sector become a catalytic force to meet our society's greatest challenges, from global health to water scarcity social immobility to food security, and in this case, helping My Brother's Keeper be move from a White House initiative into its own sustainable organization called My Brother's Keeper Alliance. At the heart of this new practice lies the fundamental belief that resonates as a central theme through the Concordia Summit, that the challenges we face are too great for any one organization to shoulder alone. And that the promise of our future rests on our ability to bridge divides, leverage our collective assets, and work together across sectors to spawn a new era that can make, as Vice President Biden said so eloquently last night, hope and history rhyme. Mo shared parts of his story, his own personal story, and he serves as an, as an inspiration to us, to us all. But he also shared the struggles and the difficulties that many in the communities of boys and women of color across this country face. I wanted to focus our panel discussion today really on the opportunity and begin changing the narrative as we speak across this wonderful panel that I'll introduce to you um, in a moment. The opportunity um, has been categorized as a $2.1 trillion market opportunity that could increase our GDP by about 10% a year if we were able to close the racial gaps and solve for the inequalities that are burdening communities across this country. And that the new role or new transformational efforts like My Brother's Keeper and My Brother's Keeper Alliance can really play a catalyzing effect and bring together an unprecedented level of tangible and effective action that can impact the lives of the 25 million boys and young men of color in this country that are at risk. To help us think about this opportunity, I'm honored to introduce a very distinguished panel. We barely fit on the stage. Um, hopefully, we won't roll off. Um, who have collectively spent decades on the front lines of so social justice, youth empowerment, and creating an enabling ecosystem critical to helping boys and young men of color change not only how they see themselves, but more importantly, how we collectively see them. So in order, um, I'd like to introduce our wonderful panel. Um, Michael Smith, who is the special assistant to the president and Senior Director 
for, of Cabinet Affairs for My Brother's Keeper at the White House. Michael Blake, Assemblyman of the 79th, 79th District in the Bronx, where, as you saw in the video, where MBK Alliance was actually launched by the President earlier um, in May of this year. Linda Rodriguez, um, Executive Director for the Fellowship Initiative at the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Kelly Denson, Director of Education and Policy Affairs for Discovery Communications. And Benga Akinabe, actor, activist, producer, and probably best known to many of you um, for the HBO show The Wire 24, and he will soon be in the upcoming film Independence Day 2. He promises to tell us who will win <laughs> at the last battle in the movie. So welcome to our panelists. So I thought I would begin with asking about this opportunity and getting into some of the details about what the business case really is. We're all aware um, of the barriers that, that Mo spoke about, you know, the systemic barriers and personal hardships um, that acutely face boys and young men of color across this country. Yet we are all bullish about boys and young men of color. What is that boys and young men of color business case? And what is the underlying imperative? So Michael, given all the research that has been done um, for the White House initiative and since then, um, what stands out to you as the core pillars of the BYMOC business case, so to speak? Yeah, it's, it's actually very easy. Robert, thank you and thank you all of you for giving us an opportunity to have this conversation and certainly delighted to bring greetings and gratitude on behalf of the president. You know, one of the core reasons that My Brother's Keeper was started was because of the economic imperative. So if you hear the president talk when he launched My Brother's Keeper about why he did it, first he talked about the moral obligation that, that we have to make sure that America remains this place where if you work hard and play by the rules, we all have a responsibility to help our kids succeed. But very quickly he went on in this, to this idea that it's an economic imperative. Uh, there's a group of young people in this country that we call disconnected youth or opportunity youth. 6.7 million young people between the ages of 14 to 24 that are not in school and not working. The vast majority of those kids happen to be boys and young men of color. We simply cannot continue to be globally competitive as the United States of America if we continue to write off this whole population of people. You know, our society is based on production and consumption. We not only need uh, boys and young men of color who are going to produce the next iPhone, uh, but we need them with jobs where they can buy the next Tesla. And so if, if we are going to have a globally competitive New York, a globally competitive United States, we've got to think about it. I'll also say the uh, President's Council on Economic Advisors uh, put out a report just a couple months ago this summer uh, that showed two things. One, if you were a little black boy born 25 years ago, you have a one in two chance of being employed today. And the reason that is, it's either early death, incarceration, or other disparities that are keeping you out of the, the labor force. That report also showed if we could erase that gap in unemployment uh, between young men of color and their counterparts, we could increase GDP by 2%. So this isn't a small, nice, heart-tugging issue. This is incredibly important for the future success of the United States of America. Thank you, Michael. Turning sort of towards the private sector and or a philanthropic organization, Linda, with uh, um, J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, you've been a real pioneer um, in sort of the youth empowerment movement and really focusing a lot on disadvantaged boys and women of color across this country. How have you made the case internally with regards to J.P. Morgan Chase, the company, and also the foundation? How have you leveraged non-philanthropic resources for this cause? Great, thank you, Robert, for including us in this important conversation. And I also want to acknowledge the folks who stuck around despite all of the weather warnings to, to hear us today. So thanks for being here. Um, you know, we see this as part of our economic opportunity worth beyond just focusing on young men of color, but uh, as part of a broader kind of 
strand or part of our thinking related to how do we increase opportunity across neighborhoods and really around the world. And so part of what um, we've been thinking about is how do we close the skills gap, right? So part of this is related to, we know that other businesses are saying that there are jobs that remain unfilled, right? Because people don't have the skills necessarily to fill them. And we know that across the country there are young men, men of color, who are unable to access those resources because there is a mismatch. And so Part of our thinking and the work that we've been doing is focusing on how we can increase opportunity for boys and young men of color, both within our signature initiative, the fellowship initiative, and also more broadly across our philanthropic investments. And so, you know, we know the private sector has a responsibility and a role to play in solving major social and economic challenges. And I think one of the most interesting things about the moment right now, and I've been doing this kind of work for close to 20 years, is that the moral imperative is so closely aligned with the economic imperative, and we know that this is good for the country, right? That this is not just something a few people are doing on the fringe because they feel like it's important. We know that this work is important for the whole country's future, and so it's an honor for us to be a part of it, and um, we are always learning from our peers in the field who are doing this work and grateful to be a part of the conversation. Thank you. So we're getting a sense of what this opportunity looks like, the combination of both a moral and economic imperative. But then what works and what doesn't? What are the things that are really working across this country? Kelly, given that you've worked um, for a while for Discovery Communications and have taken quite a bit of interest um, in these issues, um, as Discovery has, um, how have you thought of you know, changing the narrative um, with regards to how boys and young men of color um, have been perceived in our society? And um, given the recent documentary that Discovery produced, um, what has been the effect um, of that documentary? Um, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about what it contains if some folks here haven't actually seen it. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you, Concordia, for having me. Um, I'll just start off by briefly saying, because there's some confusion sometimes about the term Discovery Communications. Some people think it's a PR company. Discovery Communications is home to the Discovery Channel and other networks that are familiar to you, like Science Channel, Animal Planet, Oprah Winfrey Network. Um, and we have 14 networks across the United States, and then we have, we're seen in over 220 countries across the globe. So getting back to your question, um, what ended up happening was when President Obama really asked the nation what they could do to support My Brother's Keeper, and particularly the private sector, um, we all had a conversation internally and we were brainstorming about what we could do and we thought, mm, we could focus on education, there's those six milestones, four of them focus on education, um, we have a strong education brand through Discovery Education, but then we thought, we're a media company and people know us as a media company, we have a strong brand, we have a great reach. Um, why not change the narrative um, and change the perception of boys and men of color using the power of our brand? And what we did was we started thinking, let's do a show, and let's do a show that's inspirational in nature. Um, oftentimes, the media perpetuates stereotypes of either young black men or Hispanic men or tribal nations as very negative, and we wanted to be true to the story of what was happening, the challenges that all these folks were facing in this film, but at the same time, give an inspirational um, ending to all of it. So our CEO, David Zasloff, committed to doing the show. Um, we went across the country and looked at several programs across the show. The, the show itself is called Rise, The Promise of My Brother's Keeper. It aired over the summer, and we just aired the Spanish version uh, two, three weeks ago on September 13th. Um, and basically it chronicles the lives of several different young boys and men of color um, um, across four different programs across the country, Chicago, New York, Chicago, um, Baltimore, and uh, Marysville, California. And, and, and in addition to that, we also wanted to make sure that we did forums because we felt like just using media maybe wasn't enough. We wanted to also start the conversation. So we did forums partnering with Discovery Education, which has broad reach to schools across the country as well. And those forums and seeing those conversations, what have you seen from those um, experiences so far? Yeah, so with the forums, we had the forums before we actually launched the show and we showed maybe just a clip of the show just to get the conversation going. Um, and the, the thing that was the most compelling to me is that the kids that we were talking to, the young people we were talking to really wanted to be heard. And even in our show, President Obama, who was interviewed for our show, often says, kids want to know that they matter. And it was so funny that that's kind of the crux of our show. 
And while we were having these forums, kids really wanted to be heard. We had all these dignitaries sitting on stage. Like we had mayors, we had federal officials, we had superintendents, but the kids really stole the show and just wanted to really emphasize mentorship, wanted to emphasize having a caring adult in their lives, emphasize having the right support systems, um, having strong parents. Those seem to be some of the common themes that we found throughout the, throughout the town halls. And Benga, given your role as an actor, as, a, as an activist and an entertainer overall, um, how have you um, tried to change the narrative from your perspective? You've been quite vocal on these issues. Um, how, what has been the effect of the role that, of the things that you've done um, in this context and how have you progressed in that sense? Well, I was arrested and stood trial, so that was one of the effects. <laughs> um, I, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that change comes from the bottom up. And what excites me about this program is that it's doing just that by working with young boys and young boys of color and letting them know that, they, one, they're important, that they matter, but also that they can make the change that they want to see. In the end, that's, I think that's the only real sustainable way. Um, part of, I was, when I mentioned being arrested, I, it, it was uh, part of the first few waves of um, protesting stop and frisk and, and, and making it so that you couldn't run, like I was fortunate to be with, another, with a group of protesters that were out there regularly and made sure that you couldn't run for mayor in the city without having a stop and frisk, frisk platform. And, a lot, and what was great to see is that there was a range of, of the faces and races that are out there and ages and so on. So empowering youth is definitely, definitely the key. I, honestly, more so than, a, than some of the structures that we, we go to first for, for change as far as nonprofits and so on. We can, there will be nonprofits forever as, and until like, the people make, are allowed to make the sustainable change. So I, I think using the, the varying outlets that are now available, and you see young people doing it all the time. They're creating things to get their messages out there. They're creating music. They're creating art. They're, you know, some of it seems so strange to us as we become older and become a, a different thing than the young people we used to be. But it's, it's them wanting to be heard and, 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 and expressing themselves and, and taking power using, using social media, using music and so on. Encouraging that, giving them tools to do that at younger and younger ages. I, I think that's, I, I think that's a, a significant way in moving forward. Great. Um, so Mike Blake, so I began the question by talking about what works, and we've heard some examples of changes in narrative, but also important, as important as knowing what works is to know what actually doesn't work. Um, Mike Blake, you've been an advocate um, for college and career, re career readiness um, job creation and economic opportunity for, for a very long time, and your own personal story is an inspiration to us all. But given what we've heard from our other panelists, and I'm sure you can speak about what works very well, what could you say about some of the pitfalls um, and blind spots in trying to address these challenges? Well, the first blind spot is when you sit next to someone who has your same name and to your left as an actor. I mean, you got a challenge right out the <laughs> gate that you got to break through. You know, you have TV and finance going here. It's hard for a politician to be on stage right now. <laughs> so first, I say good afternoon, buenos tardes, dame caballeros, and bonjour. We start there because I represent the most diverse assembly district of any assembly district in this nation. The U.S. Census has indicated that my assembly district in the Bronx has an 89.7% likelihood that any two people at random will be a, of a different ethnicity or ethnic background. So we don't come at this from a, a social case. There's an economic case why we need this to work. There's a, a everyday reality on the ground that my brother's keeper in the South Bronx is not a phrase. We need it to survive. So when we talk through what's working and what's not working, what's not working is when initiatives happen collectively that are not sustainable. You know, we don't need your charity, we need commitment. I don't need you getting a press hit, I need you to be there for the profit, for the people and for your companies where you can do both at the same time. When you understand the statistics of what's going on, one of three black men in this country, currently and future, the current statistic, will that they'll be incarcerated at some point in their livelihood. So we're beyond just a theoretical exercise. 
And so one of the many reasons why I'm grateful for this opportunity and grateful to be on the advisory board for My Brother's Keeper Alliance is how do we change the narrative in a tangible way? Because what we have seen is not working is insufficient funding as it relates to education, insufficient opportunities as it relates to academic and employment opportunities, and a career and criminal injustice system that's actually making sure that more of our people go back into the system rather than transitioning out. So how do we make that, that transition? We've been able to do it in a few particular ways. We, we partnered with an organization called TechFin, Technology for Families in Need, provided 23 tablets for young people and 100 desktops for senior citizens. We identified an initiative called Workshops and Business Opportunities, 16 weeks of entrepreneurial training for 20 entrepreneurs throughout the particular district, regardless of their background. We, we partner up with Education Reform Now to de determine how do we provide support and advocacy so that you can support public schools, charter schools, private schools, and capital schools all at the same time. Why do I care about that? Because my assembly district is owed $76 million more than any other assembly district in the city for campaign for fiscal equity. So what's consistently not working is that our communities are consistently not getting the resources that they need and the continual support to execute on those plans. And what we need for those that are in the public sector, private sector, and not-for-profit sector to be thinking about is this cannot just be about a social good exercise. This has to be the same mindset you have for your businesses to make a profit, the same way you would have a continual resource and, and team to make sure you get that done. If you want to have an opportunity to do this, you have to match passion with commitment. That's what leads to transformation. So there are always skeptics, right? And um, in terms of looking at this issue, you know, while there is clearly an urgent call for action in the wider boys and women of color ecosystem, some say you know, it, is, it is really a, an ecosystem littered with anecdotal efforts, silos of success, um, a lot of information in the symmetry, a lot of reinvention of the wheel, um, insufficient, insufficient metrics to really know how the needle is moving and if it's really moving. Um, and really an underlying inability to leverage resources collectively. So even, and even if the resources are available, even if the investments are made, there are real questions around organizational and community readiness to execute um, the plans that they might have. So given that, you know, Michael, in all of the efforts that you've led in terms of trying to harmonize um, resources within the federal government. Um, how can MBK, the initiative, and, and MBK Alliance really be much more catalytic um, in trying to move this issue from the margins into the mainstream, to really um, leverage the assets in a way that can be, as, as Mike said, um, really be sustainable? Yeah, you know, there's a, uh, there's a great African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And my brother's keeper, the president would say, is not some big new government program, but it's really a call to action and an all hands on deck moment. And so when the president created my brother's keeper, you know, it was calling federal policymakers to action and creating a federal cabinet level task force that's working on policy interventions. It was calling communities to action. And I see we've got some representatives of the 240 My Brother's Keeper communities that are out there, wave, wave your hands, that Doug I see from Indianapolis, um, who are doing extraordinary real work on the ground um, uh, to, to, to make a difference on these issues. And it was calling the private sector to action. And since the launch of My Brother's Keeper, uh, there's been more than $500 million committed uh, to be invested to advance the goals of My Brother's Keeper. And it's out of a real realization um, that government does not own the business of doing good. Nonprofits don't own the business of doing good. And you know, if we really wanna make a difference, we're all gonna have to be locked arms together. And we're seeing in real ways all across the country through public-private partnerships, how you know, we're better together and, and we're doing better work uh, when we're all willing to, to step up. Linda, given the wealth of experience that you've had across all sectors, um, what are the ways in which you think aligned action and, and even going from public-private to private-private, how have you been able to combine resources with other private sector um, um, organizations to really advance um, your efforts as an organization? First off, Robert, I love the question. When I read it, I said, aligned action. Um, we should all strive for aligned action <laughs> when possible. Um, one of the reasons why we really wanted to be a part of MBK and some of the other networks that are focusing on these issues is because we know that supporting standalone programs 
while important, isn't enough, that we really need to invest in systems change and in cultivating networks that will lead to a sustained change in the communities that we're serving. And so um, for us, you know, we think about this as what, what can we offer, right? Where can we add value? We don't necessarily just want to say, well, we'll write a check, which of course, um, we, we fund a lot of programs in this space. We want to leverage our internal resources to, to support the work. And I think that is one of the critical lessons for businesses and nonprofits that are thinking about how do we build collaboratives to increase services and really have sustainable change over time. And so for us, two examples would be um, through the fellowship initiative where we have over 120 of our employees serving as mentors for three or more years, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with young men um, throughout high school and into college. I mean, we've had one cohort already and we've heard that mentors are driving their fellows to college and um, helping them figure out majors, so that work continues. And more recently, we've started working with an organization that is looking at building the capacity of nonprofits serving African Americans across the country. And so for us, we thought we'll fund them, but we'll also leverage our internal resources to build teams of TA providers or consultants that work with those organizations. And so um, there are lots of ways I think that businesses can leverage their resources to support the work. Um, when I was, prior to joining JP Morgan, I was an assistant commissioner for capacity building at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. And just about every week we had people approach us and say, how can I start my own organization? And that question made me crazy <laughs> because, I mean, it's, it's a great, I think it's a great sentiment and we applaud the entrepreneurial spirit, but when they would tell us their idea or their neighborhood and we would look it, look it up to see who else was doing that work, there were almost always other people doing that work in the communities they hoped to serve. And so I would say um, one of the best ways to build these cross-sector collaboratives is to start with an environmental scan and map what's happening and figure out how you can add value to that work. Absolutely. So thinking about how we move um, all these efforts to scale um, and the role that policy can play in really driving, driving scale, Michael did say that government doesn't have a monopoly on doing good. Um, but certainly gov government does have a monopoly on policy um, and in policy setting. So in that sense, um, Michael Blake, um, what are some of the innovative policy mechanisms that you've seen that could really be transformative um, in this particular ecosystem? We, we have a vision for our district that we call 321. Uh, three stands for the three E's of economic development, education, and equality for all two for the two paths and how we get there, strength in minority women-owned business enterprises and having a career-oriented education to go from the cradle to the career with the one goal of how do you transform the South Bronx to make it the urban metropolis of the world. And so we made a determination of how do we have concrete policies to match that vision. First, we thought about education. Uh, we have 10 of our schools that were determined as struggling schools, meaning that they had uh, the bottom 5% throughout the last three years. So let's find more additional resources for those schools. But on top of that, let's partner up those schools with career mentors, which is what they're consistently asking for. We need to show our young people the opportunity. A young person that's standing on the corner doesn't really want to stand on the corner. They just may think that that's the only way out for them. Second, how do we amplify that? So we put together a, a piece of legislation uh, to make, make sure we amplify the program of Eagle Academy. So we saw the statistics already demonstrated, 76% in terms of graduation rate collectively for black and, and Latino men. So why not amplify that to a greater scale? We thought about it from a minority women-owned business process. So currently the state pays MWBs in 30 days if they pay them on time. Well, if you're in business and someone is telling you I'm gonna pay you in 30 days and then they don't pay you, what then happens? You have payroll that's impacted. What then happens? Other communities are impacted as well. So we put forth a piece of legislation that's sitting on the governor's desk right now that will reduce the payment time from 30 days to 15 days. Why is that relevant? Because it helps create more economic opportunity in those communities. We have to address criminal justice. So we've been very clear in twofold. One, as it relates to raise the age, because New York is one of two states in this country where 16 and 17 year olds are tried in criminal court as adults, North Carolina being the other, and on a special prosecutor so that the communities can feel trust again throughout the collective process. Why is that relevant to this collective exercise? If I feel like I have a chance to succeed in school, I have a chance to get a job, and I have a chance to turn my life around if I make a mistake, then I really truly feel that you are my, my brother's keeper. So those were the policies that we put in place to amplify, but we also have to recognize it's not just on the state level where it's critical, 
it's also in the city and the federal level. You know, there was an, another indescribable tragedy that happened yesterday and, and too much loss of life that continues because of inaction that happens in Congress of not really getting stronger gun laws, which make no sense whatsoever. We took a step here in New York, we have the SAFE Act to have one of the strongest cases in, in, in the country. But you also have to be on top of that of mental health services. What are you going to do for educational opportunities? What are you going to do for employment opportunities? All of those policies are intertwined to transform and change the narrative. And Kelly, given all of your experience in the policy arena, how do you think policy could be used as a lever for change in this context? I actually think that um, we've pretty much said it here. I mean, that seems to be the common theme here. We're, we have a lot of the answers, but we need policy to kind of help those answers come to fruition. I look at the folks in the film and programs like Youth Build that marry um, the, the opportunity to get a high school diploma and also teach you work skills and teach you how to build a home, and then you come out with a feeling of confidence and you come out with a whole new set of skills. Um, I look at those programs and I look at a program like Becoming a Man that was also featured in our film that is located in southeast uh, or, or south, the south side of Chicago, but it focuses on the um, the day-to-day -day lives of these young men and the violence that is pervasive in their neighborhood. And they, the counselor sits down and talks to them and gives them an opportunity to really talk about what's going on in their families and what's going on in their neighborhoods. And sitting down with a, a man of color and, and focusing on other young men of color to really have an opportunity to talk about those things. So I think programs like Becoming a Man and Youth Build, if we could provide more funding for programs like that that focus on work skills, cognitive development, emotional skills, and provide a support system for these folks, um, I think that's really the critical thing. And I feel like that's kind of some of the things that, that everybody's pretty much saying on this panel, the support, the work skills, the skills gap that Linda talks about. Um, the more funding and support we can get behind those, I think, becomes really imperative. Thank you. We're about to run out of time, but I did want to give our panelists each um, one minute to give their own final thoughts, um, both about how you might be able to get involved with My Brother's Keeper and the efforts around our country, around this country, um, but also how you might be able to get involved as, as citizens, but also as corporates, organizations, et cetera. Maybe, Michael, start with you and we'll roll this way. Sure, you know, the president likes to say America's at its strongest when we're fielding a full team. And so you can't just sit here and, and look for folks on this stage or look for policymakers to do it. If you're a business owner, you know, ask yourself about your employment practices. Are you supporting uh, easy reentry and giving people a second chance? Are you creating opportunity? You know, J.P. Morgan Chase is doing this in a big way, but small business owners can do apprenticeships. Are you an organization or an academic and in creating uh, internship opportunities? Are you uh, yourself becoming a mentor or supporting uh, mentoring organizations? Are you advocating and thinking about local policy? Um, we're spending a lot of time on things like chronic absenteeism and rethinking school discipline, and you know, a lot of those policies are down at the local level. So, you know, I would encourage folks, no matter who you are. Uh, what sector you're in to really think about how I could make a difference uh, for some of the challenges uh, that boys and young men of color are facing. My family was homeless in Jamaica. My mama slept on church pews in, in Jamaica. Several times we almost lost our house in, in the Bronx. When I talk about this, this is a very personal narrative for me. Two brothers who were locked up, one brother who served this country for 29 years in the military. So when we come at this, first I say thank you for being committed and being in this room because you are clearly showing you want to do the work. And, and I'm saying that for those of us in the South Bronx, we need you to help us implement this vision. You know, our, our family motto, we say we went from no house to the White House to the State House. Well, I need your help to make, it, make sure we get resources to everyone's house in the South Bronx and all across our particular district. So in a very tangible way, we're in the efforts of launching a universal hip hop museum because the Bronx is the home of hip hop, salsa, and doo -wop. All three started in, in the Bronx. So we have a, a partnership with Google Cardboard for a virtual museum, but we wanna make sure we have a brick and mortar museum happen. What will that do? That will transform what's going on in the South Bronx. Tied to that as a food accelerator and food restaurants, as well as a community activist com component, so that entrepreneurs can be a part of that collective process as well. Tangibly, any and all programs that you have in your companies where you have work workshops, workforce opportunities, trainings, internships, et cetera, our office wants to partner with you for that so that our young people can get those opportunities. If you want to follow up with us, two easy ways. We're on social media on Twitter, MR Mike Blake. We do direct messages anytime. Or email, very easy, mb79 at 
assembly.state.ny.us, mb79 at assembly.state.ny.us. Thank you. Okay. Um, like the councilman said, I'd like to thank everyone who came today as well, because this rooms like this and and organizations like this are where it, it, it continues and it gets to a wider audience as far as taking it to the next level. Um, and the, these people are obviously dedicated. I would go further and encourage people. I don't think it's a matter, it's as much of a matter as policy. Policy helps with things that are happening now, people who are homeless, people who are going through what they're going through now. But I think there has to be a real disruptive structural change in the way we operate as a nation. Like there, there should be no reason why our youth don't get what they need from our our schools, our public schools. Our, our there needs to be a cultural change, and and that and that goes to how we choose to operate as a nation. The vision, and and I don't mean in a hundred years. I mean like in the next ten years, the next twenty years. The vision of, of what we have for this country and how we relate in, to one another in in a, in, in a, the public space it influences who we become and who our youth becomes. And it, and it's not. And honestly, it's a it's a more disturbing change than a lot of people are prepared to make both on both sides, liberals and conservatives. But it, I think it's what addresses the issue in a way that that solves the problem, not just uh, continues the narrative of, of, of patching, of patchwork. So I, 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 would, I would encourage people to really look at that, look at ourselves and, and, and think about what are we willing to really sacrifice to, to make that kind of sustainable change because it's not gonna be pretty right now. So two things, one, and I'll make this short and sweet, um, from a business or organizational perspective, I think figure out, because this is what we did at Discovery, figure out where the gap and need is and figure out what you do well and marry those two. A again, not to be, because you were saying sometimes it's repetitive what people do. So figure out where the gap is and then figure out what you do well and deliver, deliver on that. Um, so that's from a corporate and organizational perspective. From a personal perspective, and this is gonna sound very kumbaya, find one young person and the power of mentorship is, is so important, but find one young person and just talk to them, listen to them, encourage them, instill confidence, because even the most confident young person still feels insecure. So do that, because you don't realize that you're grooming a leader when you do that, and when you groom a leader, that's where the change comes about. We just had a, a White House um, Spanish screening of Rise, and a gentleman stood up, a young gentleman stood up and said, I wanna make a difference, and the reverend sitting on the panel is like, go do it, you can do it. He encouraged him to go do it. He's like, you're my idol. The reverend said, you are my idol to, that, to the boy sitting out in the audience. So. And I know that boosted his self-confidence. So I think sometimes it's really about self-confidence. I, I would add that find a young person for sure. Um, in our work, we find that's really what they need the most is some, a caring adult. Um, I would also say, you know, help us make this a big tent effort, right? That we all know that we can add value from, you know, wherever we are in the space. And so um, it's important to have diverse voices in this, that this issue doesn't exist on the margins, that we all understand that this is central to the country's future. And so from wherever you live in this space, reach out and find other people who can support the work. So with that, I wanna thank our distinguished panelists. Um, thank you very much.